also the second half of chapter 15, which was the market. Right. We got up to, so there's 15 parts of chapter yeah. 15, and we got up to seven mm -hmm. last time. Yeah. So this kicks off with entrepreneurial profit and loss. Okay. And uh, how'd you find this one? I thought it was good. I thought it was common sense, I guess. It made sense, like a lot of the book. Yeah. Um, but I think it's important to, you know, state the obvious, which I probably thought of some of these things, but I haven't necessarily stated it or made yeah. it into like a full thought. One thing, a couple of things surprised me about this section of this chapter. One was how relevant the argumentation still is today, like how he, Mises, preempted the objections that um, socialists will have to um, a, a market economy or, or reducing tariffs to like, oh, but you need to pay everyone the same, or oh, we need to put all producers on the same, um, same produce the same amount of output. Mm -hmm. And it's like that hurts the consumer. Like, and if they don't, ad if they do admit that, then they say, "Oh, but the um, the laborers will make so much more money with this um, fixed market that it'll it'll and they'll end up wealthier than uh, mm -hmm. if they had more goods." And uh, it's funny because I could hear the same objections coming from AOC. <laughs> uh, just like that's exactly what I would imagine right. someone like her might say. Um, and another thing that was interesting about this uh, section of this chapter is that Mises, who I thought was an anarchist, seemed to make the claim that the state, or at least the government, is necessary. Yeah, he did state that. Ugh. <laughs> it creeped me out, because it's like, how can you not see by your own logic, how everything should fall under the market. Like, there, it, there should be a market for everything, and the market produ provides everything better than a, a socialist or co like a controlled state. In an earlier state. chapter, didn't he kind of state the reason for the need of a state? I think he did, yeah. He yeah. alluded to it, and I, I pushed it out of my mind. I was <laughs> like, oh, that can't be right. But it seems like he either has a, like <clears throat> a lack of consistency with his ideology that he's professing here in this book, mm -hmm. or he is aware of the inconsistency and in includes it intentionally so as not to draw too much negative attention on himself during these politically tumultuous times. Like, he did have to escape Nazi Germany. Mm -hmm. I, I can't imagine he could be so bold as to be like, also, the state's completely unnecessary. He had to maybe wait for people like Rothbard to, to do that speaking for him. I don't know. That's just wishful thinking. Interesting. <clears throat> so, yeah. Okay. So, uh, to the study guide. Yeah. Why does Mises say profit and loss are in their original sense psychic phenomena? Can they be measured? Why or why not? Uh, so, it's really uh, a personal if you're aiming for your ends, and you know you your profit is when your your feeling of satisfaction is more than the dissatisfaction you get putting into whatever you're doing. So it's measuring your personal dissatisfaction with your personal satisfaction, which is all in your head. Totally. It can be measured in a money sense. That you could have profit and loss in a money sense, but mm -hmm. that's not that's only one type of profit. Right. And met more money doesn't necessarily mean that you're gaining um, psychic profit. Right. You know, if you're Good on point. a desert island, uh, a bunch of gold isn't going to help you. <laughs> right. So, okay. Asked and answered. What role do the complementary factors of production and the final product play 
for entrepreneurial profit? So I think it's the, the summation of the complementary factors um, minus or versus the entrepreneurial profit or the sum of all the factors, the cost of that minus the benefit of the final product is your profit or if it's negative, it's your loss. Right. That makes sense. Um, <clears throat> and one thing that was interesting in this section, maybe it was this section or no, it was, it was later in the technicians and, and bureaucrats section, I think, mm -hmm. but he says the people that the entrepreneur hires might say like, oh, you got to get the best. And the entrepreneur is like, nah, we don't have to get the yeah. best. <laughs> like actually right. look at the thing that's most profitable. So I guess that what are the main reasons for entrepreneurial loss? <clears throat> Um, error in judgment, error in foresight. Uh, yeah, exactly. Error in uh, predicting the future. Yeah. Or uh, error in um, cost of materials or some stuff, stuff like yeah. that. But it's really the about main, the yeah, future. Prediction. The main thing I really got from this is, you know, an entrepreneur is someone acting based on a vision of the future. And whether they do good or bad is based on, you know, how well they can predict the future. Right. It was funny that Mises points out that entrepreneurs don't see themselves as a class where the odds are against them. They're like, forget that. I am the best and I know that I'm going to win. My <laughs> like, uh, they're e exempt from right. that class. That's a good attitude to have. Yeah. What information do the prices of the factors of production provide us? Well, um, prices tell us the um, supply and demand of a thing. Mm -hmm. So the prices of the factors of production tell us um, I think they tell us whether the item should be produced. If the factors are more than uh, what your final product is, then you probably shouldn't produce it. Right. That makes sense. What is the ultimate source from which entrepreneurial profits and losses are derived? Hmm. I think it's the consumer. It has a, to be, yeah. The big point the in this was, you know, the entrepreneur is simply like a conduit for the consumer. Right. And whatever the entrepreneur does is, should be because the consumers want, want it. Or right. Or he'll, he'll have a loss. Right. The entrepreneur is not the philosopher. He was like, it's, it's not the entrepreneur's job to tell people that they shouldn't drink alcohol like mm -hmm. that's the philosopher's job and the entrepreneur is just going to provide whatever the people want <laughs> right so okay number nine entrepreneurial profits and losses in a progressing economy what is the definition of a progressing economy um and that would be the um the profit is greater than the loss. As in, the counter to this would be a um, circular economy where when an entrepreneur profits, it's it's accompanied with an equal and opposite loss or an equal loss on the other, on someone's behalf. A progressing economy means that, you know, someone can make a profit without another person having a loss. Right. Or worse, the, I, I don't know if he um, goes into this, but a regressing economy mm -hmm. supposedly would be one like Venezuela where just destruction everywhere. It's, it's, they're not advancing. They're not going in a, in a good direction. Right. Um, yeah. Progressing economy is one in which the per capita quota of capital is increasing. So on the whole. Mm -hmm. 
why can't surplus of the total sum of entrepreneurial profits exhaust the total increase in wealth by economic prog progress? Because that's what it's made of. Right, yeah, the, the entrepreneurial profits are like a subset or if not the same thing as an increase in wealth. Yeah, I would say it's a subset because the consumer also mm -hmm. um, accounts for part of the wealth increase. Right. Who benefits from an increase of productivity? Everybody. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. Do we have to draw a sharp line between short run and long run effects? Hmm. I. My gut says that it would be no, but personally, I'd say yes. There is a difference between short run and long run effects. Like, you know, why would you mine Bitcoin SV? In the short run, you're losing money, but in the long run, they're predicting that it'll be valuable. Yes. But I don't know in terms of this book. Well, the chapter is entrepreneurial profits and losses in a progressing economy. Do we have to draw a sharp line between short run and long run effects? I, w I would say yes, because the <clears throat> in the long run, if, if um, if entrepreneurs kept doing their thing, the, all the profits would be zero. So, mm -hmm. in order to have a a useful distinction of like what is profit and loss, you can only look really at the short term. Yeah, I mean, I feel like the economy we live in now is all motiv motivated by like short term, short run effects and gains, and it doesn't really plan like two, four years ahead. Hmm. Example? I mean, we elect a president every four years, so they Speak only... for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> the United States elects a president every four years, and all of their, you know, plans don't go ten years in the future. Like, I... No. What leader in... Uh, like what leader is feeling out like a, a 10 year plan or a 20 year plan? Everything. CEOs. Right. Business owners do that. Mm hmm. Yeah, so I guess it's the government I'm talking about. Oh, okay. Yeah. Which, right. I Which mean, is, is a huge... main factor in the economy. Yeah, it's a huge um, influence on, on the economy for sure. And, and yeah. Okay, I see that. Well, how can a surplus of the total sum of all entrepreneurial profits over all entrepreneurial losses come into existence? How can a surplus, the total sum, all the entrepreneurial profits over all entrepreneurial losses come into existence? So it's like, how is value created? It's like... <clears throat> Sure. Just, oh, I would. Yeah. I would think it's through increasive productivity and yeah, uh, ingenuity, division of labor. Yeah, yeah, producing things more efficiently than before. Right. Who contributes to economic progress? So, I think it's everyone. I guess you could say just entrepreneurs, but that's not true because. The next section is about promoters, managers, technicians, and bureaucrats. Fair. I wouldn't consider everyone to be part of the category because Mises also mentions in this chapter the people who do nothing but benefit just from like everyone else being more productive. They're like, I'll go in and pull the lever every day and not 
invest in learning new skills or anything mm -hmm. and the world will just get better because everyone around me is is working to make it better. Yeah, but that's hard to measure because then you could say like some maybe just that person's presence makes <laughs> maybe he he's not he's just pulling the lever but maybe he inspires someone next to him and that's true. That okay. counts or something. All right, so everyone let's agree <laughs> on know. that. <laughs> Is there still entrepreneurial activity in a regressing economy? Why? Well, I would say yes, absolutely. There's yeah, still you can you can have an activity that loses. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> well, and you could have uh, entrepreneurial activity that benefits, though it, it exists in a regressing economy, mm -hmm. like people who who trade Bitcoin in Venezuela. Why is the social concept of unearned income fallacious? Because um, it doesn't seem fair. Income is a reward yeah. by the people who are served most for, to the person who serves them. So that is the definition of earn, right? And that is the definition of income. So income is necessarily earned. So if you, there's unearned income, that means you're taking it from somewhere else and giving it to someone who unearned it. Which is some, not earning. Yeah, because there's no such thing as income without it being earned. So yeah. in order to get unearned income, you would have had to take it. Otherwise, it would just be called theft. Right. What is Macy's critique of the underconsumption doctrine? Gee, I don't know. Underconsumption doctrine? Is that that people shouldn't consume this much? No, it's. I, I remember thinking about this too. I'm gonna. <coughs> Hmm. I don't see anything about it in the summary. Yeah. Um, I'm going to just Google under consumption doctrine. Under consumption theory in economics, recession and stagnation arise due to an inadequate consumer demand relative to the amount produced. It means that there is an overproduction and demand crisis. So, uh, so he talked about um, when you an increase in supply is simply um, no so an increase in demand is correlated with cheapening the cost of production because you're because you're making the product cheaper to buy and so you're using less in the factors of production go on yeah, it's not a full thought. So the underconsumption doctrine is that, you know, recessions are caused because of overproduction. Okay. So I'm trying to connect those two. that Mises might say, no, no, recessions are caused by entrepreneurs, too many entrepreneurs producing the wrong thing, mm -hmm. too much of the wrong thing, and right. it's not demanded. Yeah. You know, whoops, they messed up. Yeah, exactly. Nice. It's, yeah, Sorry. yeah, it's not like, oh, if you produce too much stuff, you cause a recession. It's like, mm -hmm. no, if you produce too much of a really good thing, that's great. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
promoters, managers, technicians, and bureaucrats. What distinguishes the entrepreneur from the manager? Uh, ability to lose. Yeah, skin in the game. Yeah. <laughs> Comment. Economic calculation, as practiced in the market economy, makes it possible to relieve the entrepreneur of involvement in too much detail. Hmm. Excuse me. All right, sorry for the interruption. Um, so what is the significance of double entry bookkeeping? Ah, this was interesting. Double entry bookkeeping allows for the different parts of a business to realize which is the most profitable um, and which is not, mm -hmm. which parts of the business are suffering. Right. Yeah. And that could help the overall business succeed. Yeah, it's crazy. Uh, just the history, I think I saw a documentary behind you know, the invention of this simple accounting tool leads to like ridiculous growth. It's like, this is so simple and just the massive growth you get from just that one simple thing. Yeah, it's amazing. Like, go figure, count your beans. See yeah. how many you got this month, and like, oh, how profitable was this thing as opposed to that thing? It's like, do more of this. It reminds me of Bruce Fenton always talks about the invention of the first security. Does he? Yeah, and the company that invented it was called the Dutch India East Company. Oh. And it was, a, you know, what was happening was... Uh, Are they the ones who started at Wall Street? No, no, they, this was in like the 1600s. Yeah, that was the Dutch also. Oh, really? Yeah. Maybe, because the story goes, um, so they wrote up this security, and um, it kind of acted as like a insurance on a, a, a ship going across sea, because often, you know, you'd put 300 grand in the ship, and then if it, if it gets destroyed on its way, you're screwed. Right. So it allowed them to have like all these fleets so everyone shared in the risk taking. But that simple invention of the security allowed the Dutch India's East India Company to become the largest company in history. Yeah. Like still they today. Have, they have their own flag. They, they fly the flag over there at really? Doug's house. No way. Yeah. Yeah, because that, like, that company is bigger than like the top 100 companies today combined, which is insane. Is the, the one still you mentioned? And I think that's the company that the um, revolutionaries threw oh, it, the tea into the, the harbor, the Dutch Boston India. Harbor. Dutch India. Really? Yeah. <laughs> that's cool. Um, Though I can't be sure. Don't quote me on that. That might be the, the British East India <laughs> Company, right? So it maybe had nothing to do with the Dutch. What is the difference between bureaucratic management and profit management? Bureaucrats have to follow a directive mm -hmm. as written by an authority, a greater authority than themselves. Right, so that they're not necessarily looking for profit, they're looking to follow rules. Right. The selective process. Comment. The market makes people rich or poor, determines who shall run the big plants and who shall scrub the floors fixes how many people shall work in the copper mines and how many in the symphony orchestra. Why is ownership a liability? Because uh, you can lose it. You can lose. When you have ownership of something, you can, you can lose that. It's a liability. Well, wouldn't that be an asset? Um... Assets equals liabilities plus owner's equity, right? So, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see if it says something. The context is the selective process. 
I mean, if you don't own the business and you work in the business, then you don't you don't have the liability. You don't have the risk that you could lose it. Like ne by necessity, in order to have liability, you have to have ownership. Mm -hmm. I would think. So I guess in the context of a business, I guess it is a liability because it does. You can't. You have to earn profit every single day, and you so you have all this overhead. So you have to go out every day and cover your overhead to make a profit. And if you don't, then you're gonna lose because the business costs money to run. Yeah. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay, so there, there's a liability in that upkeep of the ownership. Right. So like owning a house, that you gotta seal up the windows and repair mm -hmm. the roof and make sure that it stays in good condition. It costs you money to own the thing. Right. Mm-hmm. The same with a car or anything. Why is it not right to pretend that penniless people are not able to climb the ladder of wealth and entrepreneurial position. What is the role of institutions? He slid something in this that I thought was interesting and important, and he didn't expand on it. He said that, so he basically said that, you know, that's not true, penniless people can climb. He said, although the formation of some institutions in the past decade could lead to this. And he didn't say what the institutions were. Hmm? Yeah, could he, lead to what? To lead to uh, the inability of penniless people to climb the ladder. Well, I think yeah. he means like trade unions and stuff that keeps people yeah. fixed. Right, and I think we're kind of in a system now where penniless people don't, it's, I guess it's harder to climb the ladder because, you know, they're constantly taxed or their money's being inflated away or... Yeah, or there's too many licenses required for them to perform their task, like hair cutting license. So the first rung of the ladder, like if you're penniless, you gotta start at the bottom. And if that first rung keeps being raised, you never can even begin to climb the ladder and that's what the purpose of like uh, trade unions mm -hmm. is, is to, to keep people out from entering the new market, for, to protect themselves from new entrants mm -hmm. who may potentially undercut them um, and lower the, the price of their services. Um, so why is it not right to pretend that penniless people are not able to climb the ladder? Because many, he says, many of the people who become entrepreneurs start as managers or start as people inside the business and climb up. Right. Why doesn't a, a degree in business administration imply a career as an entrepreneur? Because an entrepreneur is someone who sees an opportunity and goes and fills it. Yeah. It's not. It's not something to study. It's something to do. Like action, not study. Yes. The individual and the market. What is it meant by the statement the market is a social body? What are the in, what are the interventional interventionist policies not necessarily to humanize the market? So the market is a social system, and it tells you what people value, what people want and what people need and when you intervene you're not humanizing the market you're protecting some people protecting a group for their benefit at the cost of someone else's well put it since the title of this subsection is the individual in the market it's worth noting the line from Mises about Americans don't buy champagne from the French. Un-American individual buys mm -hmm. champagne from a French individual. Mm -hmm. I was really struck by that because me at La Maison Navarre, I go buy 
champagne from a Frenchman. <laughs> like an actual me. I'm a one guy and he's one guy. Hmm. And if there's some tariff in between, I mean, that just makes it worse for each of us individually. That's not hurting Americans mm -hmm. in general. It's, it's really about us. So it's uh, interventionist policies are not necessary to humanize the market because we're already humans <laughs> participating in the market. Um, why does Mises think that the think, think of the distinction made between a producer's policy versus a consumer's policy? Hmm. Oh, uh, that it's. I would think that Mises thinks that it's the same thing. Um, one is right. aimed at hurting one group at the expense of another, uh, when really you would probably want to have no policy that benefits one or another, mm -hmm. um, because it, it would benefit everyone best to have none. Right. I mean, you can't, you can't have a policy to produce the, the, to help the producer and hurt the consumer. That doesn't make sense because the consumer is just going to buy less if, you know, right. So, it's same kind with the, of nonsense. And same with uh, versus a consumer's policy, it would mean that less is produced overall, and therefore the consumers have less to buy. Mm -hmm. and which might make it more expensive for them to buy the things that they need, which would really hurt the consumer. <clears throat> what is the psychological root of the producer's policy as practiced by governments in the 20th century? and perhaps still in the 21st century. <laughs> I see this with, with Tariff Man. Um, Trump calls himself Mr. T or whatever, like Mr. <laughs> tariff, uh, because he's all about these tariffs. And it looks good to people who don't know economics, like, okay, um, we want more people to buy American cars, so we'll tax the Chinese cars. But really, the, the consumer is the one who's hurt the most, the American consumer right. and, and everyone. And also, the, you know, even the American car producers are also consumers. So we, everyone's a consumer, so you're hurting everyone. Not only that, but they're not exempt from the realities of the world, and perhaps they'd be better off facing them saying, wow, we really can't compete with this. Maybe we should turn our factories into button factories and make right. buttons instead of cars. Like, And then they would be more profitable doing the thing that they're actually best at. Right. Rather than distorting because the reality. If you're, if you're a car producer and like, look, maybe you have nothing to do with the policy, but the policy is that you know, you're protected. So should you keep producing these cars because you are making a profit but it's only because of the tariff yeah you should but it's unfortunate because it's right. a distorted market and yeah. eventually it's going to come crumbling down and you're not going to be prepared right so it's like what do you do do you just operate in this distorted market or i don't know tough call what is the lesson of the story of the man asking an innkeeper for ten dollars I missed that. I don't know what this so is. So the story is the someone goes to the innkeeper and asks for ten dollars and says, um, "So sorry, it's not gonna cost you anything. I'm gonna spend it all here at the inn." And so some people would say that, "Hey, it didn't cost you anything because I'm spending it all at your business." Which makes sense. Say that again. So you go to you go into an innkeeper and you ask for ten dollars. Yeah. And you say, and you tell them that you're only going to spend it at the inn, so it will not cost you anything, because you're going to get the ten dollars back. Ah, uh, very clever. Okay, because I think it's it's like pretty nonsense on its face, but that was the story. Yeah, so he's like, you should give me all your stuff for free because I'm going to buy your stuff with your money. Right. Uh, that so that's kind of like, I mean, if you expand it to like a, 
that's like just like the innkeeper is like the country and you say yeah I'm just gonna keep it all in I'm gonna spend it all in the country so it's gonna be fine that is exactly what the US is doing with China where they're like um, we're gonna borrow your money and then we're gonna use it to buy your stuff mm-hmm Don't worry, we'll pay you back. And right. we're like, eventually China's going to be like, no, we've, we've got the stuff. We don't want your stupid money. It's, you're, it's, or it's worthless. You can't pay us back. Right. I mean, it shocks me that, you know, they, like, these countries are still taking, like, this debt. Like, we're just giving them, like, worthless money, and they're giving us all the free stuff. Yeah, well, something tells me it has to do with the military. The, the, yeah. You know, the fact that they don't want to mess with... Like, it's a, on a smaller scale, this would be a mafioso guy being like, yeah. hey, uh, let me borrow some money from you. I'll pay you back. And by the way, I'm, buy, you know, I'm buying your stuff with it. And then they're like, this is a bad deal for me. But I'm not going to say anything about it. I'll just keep it, keep doing it until I don't have to for some reason. Right. Exactly. But what is that reason going to be? I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. It just, yeah, it shocks me that that's how the world works. Presumably. Yeah. It's amazing. It's amazing <laughs> that at scale, like, you could just scale that one scenario. I wonder what would be the, the thing that would make it stop. Like, presumably... Well, they need the... They need dollars to buy oil. Do they, though? Or yeah, because Saudi Arabia that? sells oil in the dollar. So, so they need, needed. So they need to buy the treasuries in order to buy oil. Hmm. Oh. Interesting. Hey need dollars to buy oil. That's the same, like, any money. Any money is only good if, like, for what you can buy with it. But you can get ruble, you can get oil from Russia and stuff, right? Yeah, but, like, Saudi Arabia is, like, the big oil. They control the oil. Ah. Uh, interesting. <laughs> well. <sighs> so, 13, business propaganda. What is the definition of advertising according to Mises? This is one of the few sections of the book that I feel technology has made a little bit obsolete. How so? I must have been, I'm looking at these questions. Mm -hmm. I must have missed this entire section, so I'm, I'm going to rely on you for this part. So business propaganda is pretty much, you know, anything about... It's advertising, right? Yeah, it's advertising. Exactly. Um, so the definition of advertising was, would be to let the consumer know about your product. Great. If I, if I recall, um, he said something about the, the people like revolted against this. They don't like it. People um, see business propaganda as, as like a negative thing, or at least did in his time. That they were they were going too nuts with it. I didn't catch that. Or they were they were they felt misled or too, people are too mm -hmm. focused on it. Maybe it's the promoters section that I'm thinking of. Anyway, so advertising, letting people know about your product. All right. Yeah. Um, how can advertisers influence the choice of consumer? Is it relevant to praxeology? And I think his main message was like. Yeah, sure, you can advertise, but in the end, it's about the final product. And yeah. that, that's not true. There's, like, studies of wine where you could promote the hell of a wine and say it's the most expen expensive, really tasty wine. And just the, the perception of it being a higher class wine through advertising makes the product better. Yeah. Hmm then maybe the perception of a high quality product is, is part
part of the product. Like maybe. I mean, no, it's business propaganda. How you, how you, what, how people perceive it, or is like how you advertise it, or how you display it, like what you say about it. Yeah. I mean, that's all propaganda. Hmm. So, why are business and political propaganda essentially different things? And, so this was, I'm surprised you didn't catch this section, because they talked about, um, Mizi was a little sarcastic, and when he's like, yeah, we should just have, like, public schools and, you know, politicians or everyone say the truth, or, they said, like, any infringement, so, business propaganda could, like, you can say anything, right? And it's the job of the consumer to filter through it. Yeah. And anyone, like, any law or rule that puts, like, a filter on that, like, free speech, um, basically going on, is, takes it all down. So, that, like, it, the next question is, why is freedom indivisible? And it's because, you know, the second you say you can't say this or something like that, it destroys everything, like all the freedom, because you can't say whatever you want. Right. And it's the job, it's the role of the consumer to filter through the um, the lies, or yeah, just filter through it. That's especially relevant. Yeah. <laughs> nice hat. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Do advertising costs constitute part of production costs? Oh, wait. Oh. Yeah, there was one more. What is meant by freedom is indivisible? Is that what you were yeah, talking about? Yeah, that's kind of my point. Where um, you, can't ha you can't just say, oh, you can say whatever you want except for this one little part. Yeah. It has to be everything. Right. Yeah, that's particularly relevant with all the banning on social medias and stuff, where people are like, you know, do you, fr this freedom of speech discussion is ongoing. Mm -hmm. Do advertising costs constitute part of production costs? Yes, I would say so. Yeah. You can't have much of a product if people don't know about it. Some products are very much all advertising. Like, there's a bunch of generic products that rely solely on advertising to be the best. Hmm, interesting. Like Litecoin. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> really? Do you think so? Litecoin has zero commits. They just merge Bitcoin. It's exactly the same thing, but they're like, they have an L. <laughs> it's silver. Yeah, coin. It's silver, so the gold. Yeah. God, they, they do keep saying that. It's amazing. I, I see yeah. people, there was some guy tweeted yesterday, got a bunch of retweets, like, of his price predictions of what it's all going to be, and like Litecoin was number three on the list. Why? I don't get it. Yeah, well, it, because, you know, Bitcoin transactions were expensive, so they need something that's not as expensive. But Litecoin transactions were plenty expensive when I used them. They right. got up to like 20 cents or something. It was yeah. 20, 25, 50 cents, I don't know. Have they fixed that at all? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't really use like mine. Yeah. But I mean, it's smart. They saw, they saw a need, and because you know Bitcoin transactions were getting expensive, so they just started a new chain, and I think making it silver and calling it light <laughs> was genius. Well, it's got some faster transaction time, and it. It existed before the fees got high. I mean, it existed. But they saw where it was going. Yeah, I guess so. Well, all right. And then they sold the top. Right. Charlie Lee is completely out. Yeah, yeah, he sold all his Litecoin for like $400 or something. Great. I can't pronounce this word. Hmm. Volk for <laughs> I think that's pretty good. Folk for stuff. Folk your stuff. Do you know that word? I remember it from the book. <laughs> okay. 
What is the definition of the Wolferstadt? Okay. So, yeah? Oh, you go for it. Well, without looking, I think that it was a completely state-run economy that's autonomous. So it's like everything inside of the state is produced for itself. It doesn't get anything from the outside, and it's completely state-run. Right. I, I'm not sure on if it's completely state-run, but... Yeah. Let's see. Volkverstaft is a term German statists used to denote the total complex of economic activities decree directed by the government. Mm. Okay. It embodies the desire to expand the boundaries of the state in order to acquire resources and achieve self-sufficiency. Sort of like the other, the um, Venezuelan usurpation of the oil industry and like everything else. Or the Russians or whoever. Yeah, I thought about North Korea, but they still trade with China. So there's not really, there's not an example in the world. No, I don't think there is. What is meant by Geminitz get ver arginitz? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Is that is that answered in the section here? No. Too bad. I would love to know what is meant by that. I don't know. What is the meaning of Lebertschrom? <laughs> I'll just Google it. I don't know. Folk for stuff compatible with the free market? No. Under which conditions is Volkerstaff realized? It's a... Full socialism. Yeah, full socialism with no trade to the outside of the state. Everything is um, a, what do they call it, a circular economy? Uh, everything is produced in exactly the right amount. There's no profits and losses. It's just all everything equals out yeah every day well I don't think that's necessarily like I no, mean it's not necessarily so no because like consider there is just one large state around the whole world mm -hmm. so presumably you could still have a progressing economy I suppose you could the yeah. limiting constraint that's would be true. like the resources within you know the arbitrary lines that have been drawn for the state. So that doesn't actually mean you can't have a progressive economy. Good point. Okay. So did you look up Lebensraum? Yeah, so it says the territory that a state or nation believes is needed for its natural development, especially associated with Nazi Germany. So yeah, so the Nazis believed they needed to, in order to achieve this, they needed to conquer more, more land. Right. They're like, oh, we need more re natural resources so that we can have a completely encapsulated mm -hmm. um, economy. So the Geminus get for Eichenutz means common good comes before self. That means. I would think that would mean that, like in the in the Volkverstaft, the emphasis and focus economically would be on the masses rather than the success of the individual. It's like completely di diametrically opposed to capitalism. Mm -hmm. Well, that was a hell of a chapter. I'm glad we got through it. Yeah, the next one is just as bulky, I think. Well, if anyone asks, I, I only have time to read one chapter of Human Action. I think I'll say chapter 15 <laughs> covers it, basically. Yeah, how much all. time do you have? Except for prices, this looks pretty important. Prices, maybe they need to read these two chapters. I think it's really all of part three. Uh, but, you know, the beginning of the book sets up for three. 
Okay. We should well, probably just, just read the whole book. <laughs> yeah, they should probably read the whole thing. This was fun. Great. Good chapter. Chapter 16 is next.